Hello, hello, everyone. So we are back today for another career and spirituality conversation. So for those of you who are not familiar with, uh, with us, um, I'm Julie, Julie Pohn, and I support spiritual seekers having a career experience to reconcile what they do for a living with who they are as a soul. And today, to help me with that mission, I'm uh, glad to have Ushi Bauman with me, a colleague of mine. So hi, Ushi, how are you today? Hi. I'm very good, thank you. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you, thank you for giving us uh, an hour of your time. You know, I'm excited for this conversation. But as usual, we'll start by a one minute, two minutes, one and a half minute of grounding. <laughs> and so for everyone listening, only, you know, only close your eyes if you can. Like, you know, don't do that if you're in a car, obviously. But for everyone else, let's uh, make ourselves comfortable. Maybe giving yourself a little stretch even and close our eyes and press our feet on the floor for a second just to to ground ourselves feeling the earth underneath us giving her a little uh, acknowledgement and then bringing our attention back from our feet all the way up to our chest and to the middle of our chest, to our heart. Maybe we can feel our heart, maybe we can hear our heart. And once we feel connected to the heart, just imagine as if your breath was flowing in, in and out through the heart. And from there, let's uh, take some deep, slow breath. And I'll keep the time for us for about five long breaths. Last one. Beautiful. And so whenever you feel ready, let's bring ourselves back in the here and now, opening our eyes. I may have lost track on the count now. <laughs> but hello again, Tada. Hey, it was a lovely time. It was a lovely start. It was gorgeous. Thank yeah, you. yeah. You know what? I think I'm the one who needs it the most. So the who needs it the most, so that's why I'm doing it. But I think, I hope everyone enjoys it. So Ushi, thank you so much for being here. You're a leadership coach and, mm -hmm. and your clients benefit not only from your coaching, but from your years of experience as a leader, you know, in the corporate arena. So uh, that's the part that I don't know all of the um, intricacies of. So I'm excited to discover, you know, this side of you. Um, but before we start with that, I would like to know about your spiritual journey, like what's your your connection to it, even if you have what's your definition of it, of spirituality, what's, whatever way you want to talk about it. Mm. So I had, a, I had an interesting journey around spirituality. So where I've landed now is probably... Uh, for me, there is a difference between faith and spirituality. Spirituality mm -hmm. is is about being in balance uh, mm -hmm. with ourselves, with our surroundings, with and being in touch with um, what is it that um, is right for me. It's like that, uh, you know. What is my um, role in this world? What is my um, I mean, we hear the word purpose a lot, but what makes me tick and being 
being in harmony with that and being grounded in that helps me in my in my thinking to be connected to sort of a greater energy to uh to uh to a, a good way of actually bringing the best of myself to this world mm. so seeing mm. you seeing ourselves in the big picture yeah mm -hmm. yeah and the, what yeah. we bring in that bigger picture yeah mm -hmm. i like that you use the word purpose because that that's a word that we hear a lot uh how would you define purpose purpose is uh in my opinion um a deep calling that gives us meaning in life uh -huh. that when we are aligned with that it fills us it fills our cup it makes us shine it makes us um be um develop us the strengths that we are born with i am a, a, a big believer in being born with our natural strengths yeah that uh we can enhance we can build we can develop some more than others but i think there is an intricate set of basic first sort of um skill uh, strengths that we have and they them combined with the that purpose what what's what drives us mm -hmm. when you combine that makes it makes it a very powerful combination i think that brings fulfillment that brings satisfaction that brings joy in life mm -hmm. that brings um an inner shine yeah <laughs> Yes, yeah, 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 I love that. Yeah, I see purpose as a, a self-expression, really like being able to de express these qualities that you describe, you know, and so putting ourselves in the in the right environment so that we'd be able to to radiate that and have an impact on people through our our own nature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned faith as well. Do you do you relate to faith as well? Do you have a faith as well or not? Or how is it for you? And that is a bit of a longer story. Ah, and okay. <laughs> so I've had I've had a a, a very um uh, interesting journey with faith. Mm -hmm. And I would say yes, there is a faith. Mm -hmm. uh, I've I've grown I've grown up in a very small um little uh, like the smallest of all villages in Germany. And uh, village life is very often grounded in a lot of faith. Like okay. There is a lot of, uh, especially, you know, there is multiple generations living together. So there is a lot of that passing on, a lot of that um, holding on to tradition, holding on to faith, right? It was a, a Protestant, little Protestant village. So my parents were always uh, very much in, in, in uh, that spirit of faith. We went to children's church. We, you know, there was always a community around that. Yeah. Um, so that was something that when I grew up, that was just life. That was just what it was. Mm -hmm. And nobody kind of questioned it much. Yeah. Right? And then I started to sort of uh, explore the world. And we'll come to that in a moment. And I've sort of discovered different countries, different uh, cultures, different ways of living. Um, to the point where I'm actually now married mm -hmm. to somebody who is from the Hindu background. Oh, wow. Yeah, so, uh, you know, going go, going on that journey of discovering different things, having my um, ups and downs, my my doubts, my convictions, and uh, sort of a big old broadening of the horizon, I would say, um, all the way to the point where I'm now married for 20 years. And so my husband's not necessarily very religious, but his family is. Yeah. So there is a lot of exposure to that. Mm -hmm. And with that, there is a lot of um, learning mm -hmm. about different facets of faith. Yeah. And then, you know, living in a in a in cosmopolitan the UK, close to London, where there is loads of different faiths. So you have the possibility of actually talking to so many people about it. And then uh, you know, going away, taking lots of information in and and um make it makes you think and it makes you find similarities mm -hmm. it makes you find a lot more if you want to a lot more yeah. tolerance i think there is a lot of that a lot of a breadth and tolerance and that i am a big believer in that there is it all kind of has its 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 uh its same origin mm -hmm. yeah. i really believe that there is some kind of a a larger um energy 
Yeah. You know, some people call it Allah, some people call it God, some people call it um in the Hindu religion there's loads of names. Mm -hmm. yeah. And <laughs> but uh but that overarching energy, but yeah. uh, it's it's that good energy that we connect with. And there is the energy of the earth, and there is you know, all of these things are connected somehow, right? Yeah. So and I think it's all about being human, being um uh being uh, in the spirit of of sort of positive humanity of that mm -hmm. yeah. cohabitation of the positive cohabitation unfortunately it doesn't always be it's not always like that thinking about yeah. peace and wars and things but um yeah. yeah i like that when you're talking have that um the word diversity come to mind and if we are from the spiritual point of view if we are considering that we are spiritual beings having a human experience and that we are individuations of the whole that wants to experience itself. It makes sense that we would have such a diversity, not just of culture, but also of of connection to spirituality that would generate different branches of of faith that we can like rub against each other <laughs> and see, yeah, you know, no, learn, no. yeah, le learn to get along with uh, or not, but <laughs> preferably, yes. yeah. So yes. yeah, I like I like uh, how you're describing it. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so so you you built your your experiences through travel. So can you tell us about this? Like you know, like what's through your career journey? So what happened? Like you know, how did you end up um, on the roads a lot like that? Yeah, and it's it's actually when you think when you think about it, coming from such a small place. Mm -hmm. Is certainly not something that is very typical yeah. um but i think it started with me being interested in 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 people from the very beginning so i was very lucky that my parents had um in the, the little village they built li two little holiday cottages yeah it started when i grew up with people coming from all over germany not necessarily from the rest of yeah. the world but from germany from the north from the east south and so on and so forth to come with their families and spend some time there. So that kind of opened up my interests in mm -hmm. what else is out there. Yeah. And um, I have a deep love for languages as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, from early on, I always got sort of used to the different dialects. Germany is full of dialects. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the breadth of dialects is fascinating. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I had I had examples where there were people coming from the north of Germany, coming to my village and they couldn't understand my grandmother and my grandmother couldn't understand them because of the dialects. Yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. So I always got used to that. And then, you know, at school, I started to learn French, I started to learn Spanish, English. And, and I'm like, oh, I want to know more of this world. Yeah. So I decided to study international business. And uh, and with that, I managed to get a place with that uh with Erasmus, you probably, I don't know if you remember yeah. that, yeah. there was yeah. the opportunity to go and be somewhere else for six months, for a yeah. year. So I've like took advantage of that. Uh, so my first experience was in Spain. I lived in Spain for six months to start yeah. with, to do an internship. Mm -hmm. And um, that was kind of the first time really being somewhere completely different, mm -hmm ending for my own life, not having safety net, but really being out there. And uh, it really sort of, uh, I had a, a wonderful experience, a really uh, great organization with other people that did internships. Uh, so I felt, I felt like I belonged and I felt like um, I was wanted there and it felt like a really, really good experience that really um, fueled yeah. That's probably the right word. It fueled the interest to see more, mm -hmm. yeah. to do more of this. Mm. So um, that's why I decided to to move on. And when I when I came back, I, I then went to Ireland for six months. Oh, did you? Okay, yeah. In, in Waterford yeah. in the south. Okay, East. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I spent like a semester there doing a bit of uh, studying. Yeah. Great time. And the very inter again, a very international environment. It was lovely. We had a wonderful housing house community, uh, shared house and uh, traveled and saw things, experienced things, despite being winter. 
I was there in oh, winter. Oh God, yeah, yeah. I know. But, you know, you never know. You know, like when it's winter, summer. You know, <laughs> can that's look very... fairly similar. <laughs> yeah, that's very yeah. true, actually. Yeah. yeah. Um. And uh, and uh, when I came home with Spanish and English now being sort of in in my back pocket, yeah. Yeah. I had lost my French. So I'm like, I can't lose my French. Uh -huh. So I then took the summer out and uh, I did another internship in in France. I spent a couple of months in Paris, which was another great, great yeah. experience. And I have to say that I've always been very lucky that I found people that I could connect with and they looked after me. Yeah. Right? That was always a, a very imp important um, element and that kept me going. Um, so, and then I went back to Spain yeah. and did my end of end of year stud uh, thesis. You know, when you do your diploma at the end, you do your, your thesis. I did that again in Spain. And when I came back, I said, right, now it's time to find a job. Okay. And again, fell on my feet. And mm -hmm. the first job that I found was um, an expat role. Oh. Like a graduate in an expat role. I mean, unheard of, right? So I was employed in Germany. Yeah. They sent me to a project that yeah. had its home in Holland. Yeah. Uh, what they did there is they brought together Lots of consultants uh -huh. from, uh, you know, big, big consulting firms and also sort of an, an application provider. And they brought together lots of graduates from different countries mm -hmm. to work on that project together. So another... Sounded like a, a, a corporate Erasmus. <laughs> oh, my God, yes, absolutely. A corporate Erasmus. So we played hard and we worked hard and it was like learning and drinking from a fire hose, honestly. It was wow. the best start to any... Yeah career that one can wish right wow. yeah but that also set the scene a little bit in terms uh -huh. of uh, my organized my, my career sort of trajectory uh -huh. Uh -huh. Right? it was a it was a, a spin-off at the time like a large company taking getting rid of a, a chunk of their organization uh -huh. having to sort of uh, um, come off their local system uh, their their corporate systems to implement their own kind of system environment so it was uh it was that triangle between system people and process mm -hmm. that's always a triangle that I've worked in right okay. yeah. yeah yeah it sounds like you were very much because I'm trying to tie it, tie it to you know spirituality and like a journey it sounds like you are you were very much re following your heart with that love for travel the same way that you explained at the start about purpose this thing that th this driver and following be being true to that it's like being in the flow like and all the doors opened up to the point of like literally attracting the, the perfect job for you oh absolutely it was fascinating right yes yeah. absolutely yeah. it yeah. was it was sent from somewhere i don't know <laughs> <laughs> some people believe in manifestation i'm not sure but uh yeah it's it was it was that that perfect thing absolutely and it was uh it was um to this day i am really close friends to a lot of the graduates that we started with me back then mm. uh, yeah so, really yeah know. okay yeah. yeah and you described this this triangle did you have uh did you like all of the aspects of the triangle we know you like the people aspect but how did you resonate with the other two um so the other one that played uh probably a dominant role always is process okay right? i do like structure that's probably the german side in me yeah <laughs> it's built in you know it comes with the exactly. with the package yeah it comes with the package yeah. yeah so i think the the the, the process was always one that um uh the people in the process is probably the ones that were more dominant in my life. The technology yeah. uh, was, um, I wouldn't call myself a technologist at all, yeah. but I I think I'm, I'm a logical thinker. So I could, I could grasp things and I could, um, well, actually the other thing that, um, another strength that I think I brought to the table was, to be able to translate uh, tech speak into speak that could be understood. I think that's another one that was very important. So making yeah. sense, yeah. understanding yeah. it and making sense for, uh, you know, a, a better common understanding. Mm. It's interesting yeah. because there is the language piece that comes here as well. I've never noticed that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, fascinating. Good yeah. fun. 
Yeah, the spirits that are yeah, like, you know, plugging themselves in diff different ways. But that, yeah, that's super interesting. Yeah. So from there, like, because now, now that's the part that I know that you're a leadership coach. And so you're working with leaders who are working in corporate. So from, from this amazing first corporate Erasmus to leadership coaching, what happened? Yeah. So when that corporate Erasmus kind of yeah. started to become a little dull and a little more operational, I'm like, I'm not ready for operational stuff yet. So uh, one of my friends who worked with me there, she she found another job. It was mm -hmm. a, a fairly small, yeah, not quite a startup anymore, but mm -hmm. close to it. Yeah. Uh, it was an American uh, corporate uh, consulting firm who opened an office in the UK in London and uh she got she found that job and she was uh she's like you've got to join this company this is such a great place this is fabulous and she was like literally selling it to us yeah. so uh another two of us like me and another another lady she we we joined her and we actually got a job uh so we I, I moved to the UK and um and I loved working there yeah. the culture the and in fact now that we talked about that purpose driven that um that meaningfulness that is what i felt in that company that genuine purpose driven work it was very like their values was so strong and such a foundation um that i think that's what made made that made that place so special mm -hmm. Um, and that's what sort of attracted me and really made me uh, really deeply enjoy what I learned there. So, you know, in a consulting firm, you get to you get to see different industries, you get to work on different projects. You again, you work in that multicultural world. Um, you get lots of different things you can learn. Um, it was it was a, a really, really good time. And uh, I wouldn't have left if I mm. hadn't met my now husband there. Oh. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah. Mm. And he had the better job and um, we ended up working on projects together, which wasn't the right thing. I wanted ah. to keep some kind of a separation okay. between, you know, work and private life. Mm. So um, I've made the decision to move on and uh, I ended up going into the pharmaceutical industry. Okay. Um, but again, in that triangle, in that triangle of paper process systems, yeah. um, it 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 wasn't one of the the the, the standard sort of the the GSKs or the AstraZeneca or any of those, but it was a provider to the pharma industry yeah. with lots of data assets, technology assets, and so on and so forth. And um, and I was there in that company for sixteen years. Oh wow! Yeah. When I joined them, there were about five thousand people. And when mm -hmm. I left them, there were over 65,000 people. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. the growth, they were very acquisitive. They've mm -hmm. grown by acquisition. Yeah. Um, and again, that opened up uh, so much opportunity. Yeah. Right? I worked a lot on integrations, acquisition integrations. I worked a lot on process improvement, harmonizations, transformations, change management, like uh, again, those are the, the people element is always a strong one, and the process element is a strong one. Systems kind of go hand in hand with that, but those two elements were strong. Um, so I had loads of different roles, mm -hmm. some that work better than others. Mm -hmm. Um, the reason why I did not stay, um, is it's funny enough, it comes back to the cultural environment. So the last transaction they did was a merger. Mm -hmm. So a merger of two very large companies. And while I understand the, the rationale for mergers, the problem with a merger is that um, there is a great area of who calls the shots. So who is really the leader yeah. in an organization? And when there is a desire to merge, I don't think it's a problem. When there is a bit of animosity between this culture and that culture mm -hmm. it can go sour and can really destroy the the way in people interact with each other it becomes very emotional 
and it dilutes the culture. It it destroys the culture, right? So I I reached a point where I know that now. I didn't know that back then. I back then I only knew that I was exhausting myself. Uh-huh. It was like swimming uphill. Yeah. Right. Oh, swimming uphill, up upstream. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't even budge, you know. It's like yeah, yeah. Swimming uphill, no problem. Swimming uphill, exactly. Well, actually, that was probably as bad as that. Swimming uphill. <laughs> really... Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not only you're swimming up, but you were like no breath. Yeah, no, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Oh, it was, uh, and uh, so I made the decision to to call it quits. And by then, I had two children. Um, and they they could see, I mean, I, I could see how um, that tough time impacted my private life, how it mm-hmm. impacted my relationship with the kids, my time with the kids, yeah. my own health. Yeah. So um, I, I was very lucky that my husband was very supportive and mm-hmm. he said, finally, it's about time. Yeah. Take some time out. Yeah. And that was in 2019. I took some time out to uh, recharge yeah. and to kind of find myself and saying, okay, so let's go back to what's in there. Mm-hmm. Let's go back to what really makes me tick. What really, you know, what do I want to continue doing? What do I want to take along? And what do I not want yeah. anymore in my life? Right? And that's kind of, kind of how I came across coaching because people um, make, working with people is what uh really fills my fills my cup right and you know talking about purpose i was thinking a lot about what what is my purpose right what is it that really makes drives me and i've sort of come up with a funny funny uh almost a mathematical (laughs) sentence What I love to do is to take people on a journey from A to B, where B is better than A. Oh, I love it. (laughs) Making that difference, right? That better one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Preferably (laughs) to where B is better than A. I love that. (laughs) Uh, And Ushi, I'm curious because it sounds like you're somehow up until that very last um merger experience that you you were still carried on by some flow and that you seem to have enjoyed your whole career was that last you know the merger situation was it the first time that you had experienced some you know like really stressful like uh rubbing going against your grain type of situation no it wasn't actually no, it wasn't actually and um so I had I had a multitude of different sort of incidents in the in a way, yeah. um, but uh, somehow, um, and I think I'd call myself a very resilient person. It did build my res- my resilience. Yeah. Um, it was it was fascinating actually when that very first company in the UK that I joined, I joined in an industry that then sort of nosedived. So. Uh, that whole sort of uh, business unit got closed down. So that was the very first time that I faced um, a situation where the job that I did no longer existed. Oh, okay. Uh, Looking back at it now, right, I took it very personally, Mm -hmm. but I know now what that actually was, is it was the job that was no longer there. I was still there. And I was still desired. So they really bend over backwards to keep mm. me and to transition me to a different role. Right? When you're in that moment, you don't see that. right? So you only see, you know, I'm taking this personally. I wasn't good enough. Well, it wasn't that. It was the, the job was just not good enough anymore. So I moved on. But the, so that was the, the, the very first time that I, uh, I faced that dilemma of sort of job being uh, discarded of and me having to sort of um, find my feet again, dust myself off and and keep going. And um, I think what it always helped me is um, my connectedness to people. 
I, I always I think I was always very good at building relate building good relationships, trusted relationships. So people wanted yeah. to see me succeed. They wanted to help me, which is I, I'm super grateful for every single one who did. Yeah. And I was very lucky with that, right? And then actually that happened a few times, a few times in my life where uh also in the sort of the next company along. Um I'd have to count now. Probably about three, four times. Okay. Once it happened, actually, where it wasn't the job that was made uh, that got is abolished, but I was asked to do a role that took me so far down out of my comfort zone that after a year, I said, um, "I've tried it, yeah. but it's not me." And actually, now that we're talking, yeah. Um. I notice that it was too close to that third part of the of the triangle. It was too close to technology. Yeah. I was leading an IT team and I was too close to that to the I was too far away from the, the I was still having the people in the process but I was too close to that technology piece. Yeah. It, it wasn't me. Yeah. So it's interesting I, because it's as if like the people and and process were the your foundation and we all said it's we need to get out of our comfort zone but probably up to a point where it's not throwing us over the edge of who we are right absolutely absolutely and i had never made that connection until now it was too far down down that technology path for me that's yeah. interesting because i think that's great for people to hear who might be in in circumstances mm -hmm. like that you know like having a little bit through your story having the distance that they can't have for themselves yet about, oh, what could it be that's not uh, working? Because I bet that in that type of situation, there might be an attachment to maybe not not wanting to quit because seeing it maybe as, oh, a failure or like not not being able to take on that that challenge. And so to people who might be thinking that, considering your experience, what what would you say to them? What I would say to them is uh, it's okay to give it a go, but I would always say trust your instincts. Mm -hmm. And uh, perseverance is good, but there is a limit to it. Mm -hmm. Trust your instincts. My instincts quite early on were telling me that it wasn't the right thing for me, oh, but that perseverance was just a louder voice than the quiet intuition that said mm. uh, so I kind of needed to learn the hard way so I really grinded myself down and uh, I reached a point where I said to my uh, work for the CEO back then I said to him um, I don't care if you want to make me redundant or whatever but I can't continue I'm not the right person for the job I've tried yeah. so I was ready to just give it all up I've I've really you know reached that limit and and he was a he was wonderful he was a very personable lovely lovely guy um, loved working for him and uh, he actually gave me good advice and not as a boss but more as a as a friend or a an older brother yeah <laughs> mentor maybe yeah. yeah mentor yeah. And uh, he said, "Don't throw it away. Don't uh, don't make rash decisions. Find some distance, and then and then uh, reconsider mm -hmm. what what is important in the grand scheme of things. Don't just drop it and run. Right? Okay, yeah, balance yourself again. Mm -hmm. And like you said, like you had clues that it wasn't really the right thing for you. If you were to do it again, and this time listening to your intuition." How would you know? Like, you know, what 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 I guess what 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 I'm wanting to ask is what was it about your intuition that you didn't listen? Or uh, how would you listen to it now if that was to come about again? Um I would I would call it in continuous discomfort. Okay. Mm -hmm. So 
it's about sitting next sitting next to your chair if that oh. makes sense yeah right yeah. so you're not sitting on your place you, it feels like you're sitting next to your chair it, it's the discomfort of something's not right can't put my finger on it right so there is one thing about be, being out of your comfort zone and developing and growing it was probably just it just felt too much out of balance okay yeah and uh and um uh it it then you know that 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 stress that cortisol that that constant continuous um feeling of being on the on the fight right mm -hmm. so being mm -hmm. on the defense yeah. uh that didn't really ease off oh. so i was always in that on that edge yeah. right it was just too too much on that edge um, and I, and I think there is there is a, there is an important one here, and it's to say, you know, um, have I still got the right level of enjoyment despite being out of the comfort zone? Okay. Mm -hmm. Or is it too much, too far out there, where you're saying actually I'm finding it difficult to connect with something that I, I really enjoy? That's an interesting one. There, that there should, like speaking again, like tr finding other equations. <laughs> So we need to have a good ratio of uh, out of comfort zone and enjoyment. Yeah. 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 And it's funny how you, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, um, something comes to my mind just now. And I actually spoke to somebody about this this morning. And I don't know if you've heard of Marcus Buckingham. No. No. He's I've heard of Buckingham Palace, but that's about it. So Mark Buckingham, um, I've read I've read his book Love and Work, and um, what I love about what he says is, um, if you have enough red threads in your life, in your work, in your life, enough what? Sorry, red threads. It's like a red um, um, piece into of into a tapestry. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So the red thread being um, the things that you love doing. Uh huh right uh things that fill you the things that you say um i find a moment of flow when i do that yeah right and um he also puts strengths very much into perspective a strength is only something that you're good at and you enjoy doing if mm -hmm. you're good at something and you don't enjoy 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 it it yeah. weakens you so it's actually a weakness it weakens you so what he says is if you have 20% of red threat yeah. in your sort of daily overall life, that is enough to cope with the 80% that are not so much red threat. That's that sort of that tipping point, he calls mm. it. I, I don't know if he calls it the tipping point, but that's why I'm calling it. But that's mm. sort of the ratio that he sees as being um, a, a good amount. It's yeah. like the Pareto principle. So 20% of red threat are dealing, you know, are enough yeah. to deal with the 80 percent of other colors yeah it, it's uh it, yeah, absolutely there's definitely a parallel here yeah but i like i like that idea yeah. and uh but it also gives it makes it very visual and it says you know have i got enough things in my week mm. that i enjoy doing right yeah. Yeah. so yeah. you didn't have enough red thread in that particular position yeah it's funny when you were talking about it with the being beside the chair you know, I had, you know, some sort of visual. It's like if if the the position is right, if there is enough red thread, so being out of your comfort zone should look like standing up from the chair when you're out of comfort zone, but then you, you can sit down on it and it's still the right place to be in. So you okay. get up, you stand. And in your case, you were not even on the chair, like you're beside the chair, so you had never anything to sit back on. Yeah. So no wonder it's exhausting and yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And so also I'm curious through your journey because this last merger where mm -hmm. you finally decided to change to the point of setting up setting yourself up on your own basically, did you ever have that um, aspiration or did that ever come up for you in some of the the previous? critical situation that you've experienced had you never thought about going uh, go, going solo somehow or 
doing something completely different. How, how was it? Yeah, I've actually always had that in the back of my mind. Mm. And it probably comes from the fact that my uh, my dad mm. um, was uh, started his own com little family business. Okay. So he was always a very sort of a free spirit. He was mm. never able to work for somebody else. Okay. And um, in a way, I loved the idea of that freedom. Yeah. Um, what I always struggled with is... Uh, to find that right um, content of my own business, right? Yeah. What is it that I'd want to do? Mm -hmm. right? You know, thinking about products, thinking about this, thinking about the other, right? And ideas, but they never really um, excited me enough. And, uh, you know, th at the time when when I was looking for something else, right, that was the time when coaching really started to take off, right? And then uh, shortly after, we had COVID, right? COVID was a horrible time, but it also brought some opportunities. Mm -hmm. And that is that whole virtual side of our working. You know, you and I speaking, right? Yeah. Me being able to take a, take a, a, a coach, make it do a coaching diploma, not necessarily physically somewhere in, in, in the country where I'm at or in the environment where I'm at, but I could go into all sorts of countries so my coaching diploma is actually from ireland funny enough oh wow okay yeah i know it's it's funny right so lots of connection to ireland um so uh um so yes it was always there somewhere but um it was a tiny seed yeah. that i don't think i looked after enough okay. and when i had that moment of actually stepping away from the rat race yeah. I'm having a moment of recharging and a moment of reflection. Um, there is a few things that I noticed. And one is my hunger of learning mm -hmm. that I had um, locked away somewhere. I mean, I always learned, but it, it was uh, it was that learning on the job, the learning what sort of was, was thrown at you rather than what is it that I want to learn, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. There wasn't space for that. And having suddenly this, this, you know, there is green fields. Yeah. I can do something. I can go down a path that I want to. That was a, that was so liberating. And and having found something that really uh you know excited me. Coaching excited me. I always love working with people. I, I'm good one-on-one, -on -one, good in small groups. I'm not so good in massive groups, but but um, I'm hoping I'm hoping that comes through. I, I love creating a lovely, trusted, close environment where people feel happy to just be themselves. Yeah. And I just uh, love that. But I got to say, I'm sure, like I'm sure I won't be the only one noticing. You know, I don't know. I, I I'm pretty sure we'll come across. You know, when people will listen to this to the recording afterwards. But I can feel that. You know, like the energies, like you're bringing some soft, calm, you know, just your energy, you know, so it's like, it feel like everything is peaceful. And so, so yeah, I think I, I'm sure that people will, will feel that as well, because I very much feel it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and then that's, that's exactly how I want to be. That's how I want people to experience mm -hmm. my coaching, because I, I am, um, I love working with people yeah. who also love people. Yeah. Who want to develop more of their human side and leadership. That's sort of my tribe. Yeah. Right? I've, yeah. no, I've I've experienced too much of the others. Mm -hmm. And I I cherish when when you have that personal connection. I think it it makes a difference in how you inspire the teams and how you inspire yourself mm -hmm. and how you inspire individuals who are around you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So maybe it's a good time to ask you how, who do you work with and how do you support them? Like, uh, is there, is there a specialty to your coaching or who is it for? Yeah. So um, for me, it's it's all about leadership, and you don't have to be a leader of a big company or a massive team, but you can be a, a leader in your in your sort of daily work without having direct 
people work for you, but you still can make a difference. You can still lead initiatives, lead idea generations and so on and so forth. So for me, that leadership, right, that uh, wanting to inspire. I love working with people who want to be more inspirational, who want to, who want to make an effort of bringing other people along, but um, somehow based on basically maybe their experience or their belief system or whatever it is, something holds them back and they don't quite dare. So sort of unlocking them to just be more themselves and actually getting to know themselves better as well. Right? Is so it really, that triangle? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. yes, absolutely. Uh huh. There is a lot of a lot of that. I mean, I think good leadership starts with with a good portion of self awareness, um, mm -hmm. of non judgmental self awareness, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very important one. Um, it's it's about uh, who am I? Who do I want to be? And how do I accept myself the way I am? And then I can show up very differently. Once I'm grounded in myself, then I show up very differently. Right? When I'm not so worried about, I'm not giving my power away. Yeah. No. Yeah. Not being worried about what other people, how, how we're going to be perceived. And yeah. 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 And yeah. at the moment, what do you see as maybe recurring problems or patterns that your that you know the leaders in today's world are having from your experience working with people um so there is i think there is as soon as there is a portion of fear coming into people's lives right um people take themselves back right so there is there is the fear of ai there is the fear of the walls there is the fear of the change there is the fear of the you know the you know the environment that we're living in there's so much fear right the 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 incredible dynamic challenges out there today that we're faced with and the speed of them right so as soon as you you're entering that fear of um the future yeah. that's probably the best way right and i think there is there is an important important um takeaway here is that is when we are out of balance very often we're worried about something that's happened in the past or we're worried about something that will might happen in the future and we're making assumptions but it's about it's about bringing people back to where am i now and mm -hmm. to embracing that here and now and that present that present moment and it doesn't mean that we condone things, but it means that, you know what, I'm going to take things as they come. And I, if I'm grounded in myself, I um, I respond to things very differently. Mm -hmm. I think there is a lot of that fear. And there is corporations that are run by fear. There is states that are run by fear. And there's just so much of that happening, right? Yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah is that, that we all know the fight or flight, it doesn't make us... It's not conducive to our best selves, right? Yeah. No. Absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and yeah, right now it feels, even if you're lucky enough to work in a place where it would be the ideal, you know, a la la land of a, of a position, everything that's happening out there in the world, you know, is, uh, is here to catch, you know, uh, catch us anyway so if it's not in the job it's out and like we all have uh problems our, our own like problems with family and all of you know it could be health and anything so what's so what would be your your advice to people you know to deal with that overwhelming fear that's uh, like fear factors that are everywhere seem to be everywhere nowadays mm -hmm. Um, so I'm a, I'm a, one of the things that I'm using, uh, in my, in my coaching is for example, positive intelligence. You might, you might. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But let's make, because, because I know what it is. Doesn't mean that our yes. audience know what it is. Okay, yeah. So positive intelligence, is a, it's, it's, I find this is a, it's a, it's a fascinating model mm -hmm. that helps us 
um, that helps us probably uh, manage ourselves better, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Um, so it there is a there is a large element again of self awareness yeah. of getting to know yourself, getting to know um, our way of our habitual way of reacting, and um, I think there is we've learned so much in the neuroscientific um, world now that uh, we understand a lot better what the brain does, yeah. right? And um, we we have our brain is made to keep us safe yeah. and to uh, be efficient. Mm -hmm. So in order to keep us safe, it focuses on the threat before it focuses on, you know, what might be okay because it needs to protect ourselves. And then the efficiency, it, it, uh, it, it wants to, um, it wants to rely on experiences already made. So when there is habitual behavior that we have, it says, is it sufficient to reuse what's already there rather than having to use your conscious mind constantly to, to say, how do I respond to this situation right now? Right? You know, take it, take crossing the road. If we had to, to make consciously make every move, it, it would be exhausting. <laughs> yeah. Right. So they're constantly relying, the brain constantly relies on, on the past, basically. So it keeps building the future based on what we've experienced before in the sense. Yeah. Yeah, in a way, it says, okay, so I know this, so I know what might happen. If I make an assumption, and that way, uh, I'm, I'm going to make you react that way. Yes, right? yeah. So where it comes down to is um, to understand one's own habitual behaviors better mm -hmm. that um, might take us into a place that doesn't help us, that doesn't serve us, that makes, that puts us into a place where uh, we are out of balance and we feel we are too much in that fight flight yeah. that fight flight has got its moment but if it's prolonged it's 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 damaging us right uh when when we when we are facing a moment and the cortisol gets produced it's a message but it's recognizing that and saying okay so what is it trying to tell me and now how can I react to that there is no more cyber tooth tiger saber tooth tigers out there that jump at us right when but we tr we get triggered by situations that are not life threatening right so those moments to recognize and and sort of having the the means to ground ourselves again what you've just done earlier that moment of grounding that gives you access to a lot more uh brain power to then respond rather than react in a more conscious way when I know it's about that noticing, what am I triggered? And then bringing yourself back. And then choosing who do I want to be? How do I want to be? What is my way? Right. Yeah. So knowing in advance, like being aware of our habitual ways of reacting so that instead of reacting, we can now choose and respond and possibly respond in a, mm -hmm. in a more creative way and respond in a way that is not the habits from the past, but generating a new a new way to move forward absolutely there is this lovely triangle called think feel do right mm -hmm. it starts with the thought um <clears throat> they're then added with assumptions and beliefs okay. they make us feel in a certain way that makes us uh, that makes us behave in a certain way that then leads to outcomes so mm -hmm. but that whole circle we can influence yeah. we are not who we who, uh, we are not our thoughts Mm -hmm. What we do is we have power over our thoughts if we choose to. We can think in a different way. That can then make us feel in a different way. And then that makes us behave in a different way. So empowerment around that. Yeah. And when we're in fight or flight, we don't have that distance to be able to change that thought in the first place. We're in that loop. Right. So, yeah. So hence the working with someone or like with a coach and and. I know from experience that the beauty of the positive intelligence is that they have the like it's bringing the tools to reduce that fight or flight so we can get that that um that spark of intelligence back yes absolutely <laughs> yeah yeah because you know and again tying it to spirituality i find that this is core as well this uh self-management 
And that it all more often than not starts by that. It doesn't start by the spiritual stuff. It starts by regulating the physiology so that we so so that we are able to hear something different. We are able our body is in a place where where it can tune it to, to intuition. It's not in that fight or flight constant survival loop. Absolutely. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, Probably more than ever, that's a like that stress management and self regulation is needed. Yeah, it's about thinking. Thinking about um, again another piece of neuro neuroscience. We know that we brain cells are not just in our brain, but also in our heart and our gut. So it's about it's about reconnecting, reintegrating, and being again um, our whole selves. When we're in flight or fight or flight, we are too focused on on that on that focus on the threat and the uh, and and we're not integrated anymore. We haven't got that access, right? So we're we're selling ourselves short. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's and got its place, but <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But like, you know, I know they say, they say that I think in uh, we're actually less under stress somehow in ancient times where it was real real life threatening threats because there was more time in between the th the threats to come back to a baseline yeah and now there is like it, it might not be life threatening like in for some of us i know like in some parts of the world it is very much life threatening you know sadly but for you know for us and probably people are going to be listening this it's not but then it's like these maybe lesser threats but there's so many or like it feels like they're so constant that we don't even have the space to come back to our to our relaxed baseline in between that's what trips us up isn't it absolutely right absolutely right it's that constant being triggered that constant next thing next thing yeah so how is uh how you know now that you're like you've made the jump, uh I don't know why I'm I want to ask you, how how has your life changed like how how different is it for you like how happy are you what's uh um oh how is it so um I think I see the I see uh, the I, I see the whole, the whole life um very differently. I see it a lot more positively. You know, the glass is half full rather than half empty. I actually I'm excited to get up in the morning. At the end of the day, I think back and say, oh gosh, I had such great sessions. And uh, very important is that balance between doing what I love and also being there for my family and meeting, being able to meet from it with friends. Uh, nourishing my boys. I've got two sons. One is 14 and a half. The other one is 17. And uh, with them being teenagers, we have a wonderful relationship. We really do. Yes, they get on my nerves sometimes and they got on each other's nerves. But overall, I think we have a wonderful um, environment at home and they come to me, they talk to me. And, um, and there is lots of respect there, and there is time when there is needed. There is moments when we don't, but that's normal. Yeah. But we're there for each other. Yeah. And, and I think that's. That, yeah. mm -hmm. And is that from? Did you notice a change from when you were working full time? Well, working in a, a employed type of a, a situation to now working for yourself. Is that this transition, or is that that you became? You know, you becoming a coach have more tools. <laughs> I think it's a it's a combination of both. I mean, uh, what we had to do before is uh, we've had au pairs in the house, uh, quite a few of them. <clears throat> but um, and and uh, that in itself has taught them a lot. So there isn't only negatives. There is. A lot of uh, different perspectives that were brought. It opened their their horizon, right? It uh, certainly brought different dynamics into the house. But at the same time, being a mum, um, I always felt a bit guilty. I always felt a bit bad about outsourcing certain things that I actually wanted to do but I couldn't. Yeah. Right. Um. So. It. It just, I, I don't think the balance was right. 
and now the balance is right. I can still do what I love doing. There is, there is, uh, and I'm not always there for them. I'm not, you know, I'm not I'm dropping everything when they when they tell me to jump. But it's about it's about having more opportunity to be there for them when they need me. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, I know you said earlier that it was always at the back of your mind and you hadn't made the jump until uh, 2019 to someone who has also that in the back of their mind what would you say <laughs> any tips any advice one of the one of the things that i always say is um it's never too late mm. never too late to try something new and um you don't have to do such a um, rigorous change. It's not necessary. What you can do is to look at options and say, how can I experiment? How can I try things? Maybe piloting something, maybe maybe sticking my toe in the water in mm. what I fancy doing, right? It doesn't have to be straight away, but but open yourself up to the to the idea of even giving it a try, right? And then see if you like it. If not, you know what? I was in my late forties when I changed. Mm. So, a lot of people say, "Well, age, mm -hmm. it works." There is enough examples out there of people that make it work. Look at those. Don't yeah. look at them who are, who don't have the courage. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I like that. So, Ushi, is there anything that we haven't talked about or that I haven't asked you that you that you want to address that you you want to talk about before we? finishing our conversation um maybe maybe a message to everybody out there and that is um make time for yourself mm -hmm. it's not selfish mm -hmm. to make time for yourself it is uh think of it that way if you are well in yourself you can be so much better for everybody around you yeah I think that's a really important thing. And that is, you know, in, invest in yourself. Is it, be it going to the gym if you want to, eating well, having a coach, uh, taking some time out, closing the door, reading a book, whatever it is, you know, find the thing that that help you fill your own tank. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's important. Easy mm -hmm. to forget. Yes. It's easy to forget, but reaps massive benefits when we don't. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. yeah. Thank you so much, Ushi, for spending this time with us. That was super interesting to see the all of your you to see your the fullness of your red thread. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I wish you like uh, the best, you know, best of luck for the the coaching and um, and all of the the people that you're impacting through your work and to mention that for people to reach out to you like the link will be i'll add as usual all the links you know where they where they belong in the communication but in case you hadn't noticed uh yes you can scan ushi right now <laughs> so like yeah see you said the tech was not you know but the point the point of the triangle but look you know <laughs> I see that that's very clever so yeah. thank you so much thank you Ushi and uh, to everyone who listened to us up until the end thank you as well and I shall see you next week for another career and spirituality conversation bye all the best bye bye